okay um, oh sorry before we move forward let me ask sir is that fish <laughs> pardon pardon my my i'm not very artistic you know it's beautiful i i try to i try to just work around good enough to explain that's all iram knows iram has been sticking around devangi and iram they know it she often laughs at my art but that's okay you know that's what you know sir it's, it's beautiful and i was talking about iram she is she is a pro player okay uh just let me pin this okay very good so to give you a quick summary of phylum chordata uh, before that wazia and yusuf uh, why don't you just introduce yourself like uh, something about you we should know because if you're going to stick with us devangi iram and me should know and so let, uh, we all can do that like quickly just a name so let me start with my introduction my name is rahul kushwaha and i'm a faculty of biology at learnivio and i like teaching biology it's 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 something that is born out of my interest for biology but uh, apart from that i am a biological researcher i am pursuing a career in research currently doing uh, research in neuroscience and behavior in my phd and i like teaching and pre- uh, preparing students for research careers to be medical aspirants doctors uh, basically anything that you want to be in biology so that's me and you will get to know about me more as you will go along just one second yes manan okay yeah okay so uh, iram devangi since you have done it before also quickly so that waziha and yusuf can introduce themselves let's start with iram hello my name is iram uh, i stay here in doha qatar and study in ms indian school yes and by the, by the way thank you so much i stay in in new delhi india yes devangi hi my name is devangi chando and i stay in ghaziabad uttar pradesh india and my school's name is sethanandram jaipuria school okay wasdiha and yusuf because since you are new you can also tell us something about like something that we should know about you a hobby or something what do you yes, want to know <laughs> well uh, i'm from saudi arabia currently living in saudi arabia but i am from uttar pradesh aligarh and i'm studying from school. aligarh okay. yes sir and i'm studying okay. in international indian school dammam okay anything Masiha. else i uh, like it will work for now you know over the time we do chit chat we talk about it it's not like we just i just don't keep talking about protocol dates you know you will get to know so we'll get to know each other more wasia this is just to get going yes my yeah. name is wasiha malik i am from west bengal but i live in new delhi in india and wow, so my school name what? is raja ram mohan roy school and i have many hobbies such as i am a good artist and you are a good I'm artist a good singer yes i am wow. a good singer and so you you are you are getting the training you are getting training for like vocals no or no okay you you have developed that on your own okay but so you should also think about you know getting some vocal training about it because yeah what is gifted say. you with something yeah you should you should nourish that because this is the time right <laughs> this is the time of believe course, me sir. believe me when i say this okay so let's begin so iram will be taking over the teacher's position she often does that in the class she's she's very very 
interested in teaching all of us sometimes me as well so she will tell us about before that i will just briefly tell you about what i taught about phylum chordata and phylum chordate we call them chordates because they have notochord which is present as you all know and because chordates are of different types so there was a need to create a sub phyla in which we can put chordates as urochordates which is tunicata cephalochordates and vertebrates this is vertebrates are what we are going to study in detail and is also a major uh, like importance for your entrance and exams about tunicates and cephalochordates you just have to know that these two categories of chordates are not proper full chordates so in tunicates notochord is only present in the larval tail so it's not present in the adult body or in other parts of the larval body also doliolum and salpa are the examples which i have not seen any time they have not they don't ask it but just know that tunicates have notochord for a specific time period in a specific region of the larva that's all that's why they are not considered true vertebrates and cephalochordates also have notochord but in them the notochord is present from head to tail like in the complete organism and it's persistent throughout the life okay but the point is it never gets developed into a vertebral column it stays as a notochord only notochord is a um, mesodermally derived tissue it's muscular so it stays that only it never becomes bony like in vertebral column so both tunicates and cephalochordates are together known as protochordates proto because they are primitive uh, and vertebrates evolved later so we will focus and shift our attention to vertebrates so vertebrates possess notochord in embryonic stage and later on it gets replaced by vertebral column which is bony or it can be cartilaginous depending on what kind of skeleton the organism have so there are bony fishes and there are cartilaginous fishes like sharks so their vertebral column is made up of cartilage because their whole skeleton is made up of cartilage now some criteria of uh, some characteristic feature of vertebrates is that they have a ventral muscular heart now it can be two chambered three chambered or four chambered depending on which class we will study in vertebrates fish have two chambered heart to begin with amphibians and reptiles have three chambered heart mammals and birds have four chambered heart and they have kidneys for excretion and osmoregulation and paired appendages appendages includes both limbs and fins so fins are the appendages for fish and limbs are the appendages for organisms that live on land they are called tetrapods then as i said that we will only focus on vertebrates so we will take forward the subphylum vertebrate and start studying the classes so in the subphylum vertebrate the first division yes do you have a question was it no no so would you like me to in this okay yes see i told you you know yes the teacher yes you can take from here yeah sure so classification of vertebrates uh, vertebrates are divided into two categories one type of organism do not have jaw they lack jaw and call as ignatha so under this there is one class which is called as cyclostomata second yes, class you would like you would also like to tell that ignatha word comes from jaw so if ignatha is there it's jawless yeah ignatha yeah jawless and ganatha is with jaw so second class is ganathostomata which be a jaw and they are further subdivided into two categories one is fish which is called as pisces again further divided into chondriacthes and um, osteichthyes osteichthyes and second one is tetrapoda under ganathostomata second one is tetrapoda the word tetra means four and poda means limbs so they bear four limbs tetrapoda is further divided into four classes amphibia reptiles apes and mammals um yeah the first class under ignatha is class cyclostomata they are ectoparasites they have 6 to 15 pairs of gill slits they have no scale on body and have um paired fins their cranium cranium is the skull and the vertebral column are cartilaginous cartilaginous and they are marine and lay egg in fresh water that's called as spawning after spawning their parent die and their larva after metamorphosis return to the ocean yes um, so so the rule is uh, iram just one second sorry to interrupt you 
So for uh, Waziha and Yusuf, uh, the rule is that to make biology easy, right? It's, it's anyways very overwhelming and a lot of things have to be remembered, okay? So we in the class focus on two things. One is to understand the words in biology, like what Iram just did above. She showed you that if we know the meaning of Gnatha, then a Gnatha is jawless and Gnathostomata is jaw. And you will see that many of these terms like chondry is cartilage, osteo is bones. Tetra means four, limbs means, uh, poda means limbs. Cyclo means circular, stomata means opening. So those who do not have jaws have a circular opening like a sucker. So things become easier if you study like this, okay? So this we will do um, constantly <coughs> in the class. <coughs> is it clear, Waziha and Yusuf? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the rule is that for this, these seven classes, which are mostly multiple times asked in entrances and also in boards, we will read the pair. So if you have NCRT, please open the NCRT uh, and come to these classes in vertebra, uh, phylum verte vertebrata. You will see that they, there are paragraphs of varied lengths. But by reading every paragraph, the homework that I gave to Iram um, and Devang in the last class, was you have to read the paragraph and you have to figure out the five most important points for that class. Everything else is just common. So if I say that they have two chambered heart, all the fish have two chambered heart, for example. Okay. So you don't have to write that every time in every class because that's just overwhelming information. You know that fish have four chambered heart and amphibians have three chambered heart. No need to write that over and over again. Fish have scales and fins. Amphibians have legs because they are tetrapoda. So no, no need to write that. But the important char characteristic features are these five. So that we did in the last class for two and Iram is going to tell us for the uh, rest one in today's class. Yes, Iram, over to you. <clears throat> Yes, so um, the first class under Gnathostomata is class Contractiles. They have cartilaginous endoskeleton. Their mouth is lo located ventrally. Gill slits are separate and without operculum. Operculum is the gill cover and they have tough skin containing placoid cells. Due to the absence of air bladder, they have to swim constantly to avoid uh, sinking and they are cold blooded uh, po poiculotherms. The second class is class um, Osteothes. Osteothes. It includes marine and freshwater fishes with bony endoskeleton. Their body is streamlined and the mouth is mostly terminal. Most fishes have their mouth located in the front side of the head, pointed forward. That's called as a terminal mouth. And their skin is yes. covered. Okay, with... okay. So we, we can do one thing. Uh, I will write. You tell me and I will, I will write for you. Okay. Okay. So, so basically it's the class three, which, which is the class two under Pisces. Okay. The first was a Gnatha. In Gnathostome, there are two divisions. One is Pisces and the other is Tetrapoda. In Pisces, there are two classes. First was Contrapathize, which, which is second class in total. Third class is Osteopathize, right? Yes. Yeah, so what about Osteopathize? You want five things. So you remember the rule. You have to tell me just five things which are most important. Rest everyone, uh, rest everything is common, common sense. So the word osteopathize says that they are not uh, cartilaginous. They are bony fish, right? Yes, Yeram, tell me. <clears throat> um, it includes marine and freshwater fishes with bony endoskeleton. Yes, endo means inside simply in biology. So. Uh, Skeleton from here onwards will be endo. Endoskeletons are where um, the skeleton is inside the body and you cannot see the skeleton from outside. Like in humans, we have endoskeleton. But if you look at insects, insects have an exoskeleton. So the hard covering the shell is their skeleton and it's present on the outside of the body. So that's called exoskeleton. So osteopathies have a bony skeleton they can be both marine and fresh, fresh water breeding. Okay. Then second, what do you want me to write? Um, the body is streamlined and mouth is mostly terminal. 
Yeah, body is streamlined and mouth is terminal in case of chondriac thighs as well. Remember? Sorry, uh, mouth was ventral there. Yeah, my mistake. Here the mouth is, you are saying terminal, right? So terminal and ventricle, this is what I was drawing here. Um, yeah, Yusuf, I was trying to show. So this is when you draw fish, if you draw the mouth like this, this is a terminal mouth. But if you draw fish, and if you draw the mouth like this, this is a ventral mouth. So terminal means it ends with mouth, but here it does not ends with mouth. Mouth is somewhere here. So this happens in case of sharks. If you see, sharks have this kind of mouth, which are, and sharks come in contrary of thighs, but fish that are mostly eaten uh, from the river, like um, um, uh, all the freshwater fish like rohu, etc., they have terminal mouth. You understood? So they have terminal mouth, and their gills are covered. Osteoctis gills were open, so their gills are covered with, covered with what, Iram? Cycloid and tenoic scales. Oper operculum, gills, gills, not skin. Oh, operculum, yes, no. operculum is like a covering for the gills. So for these fish, the fish that mostly comes to the kitchen for cooking have operculum. Okay, you have to remove the, the, those things. So if you have to just put finger and open it so that you can see the gills. Whereas in sharks, what I was trying to draw here, these kind of cuts are present in shark, right? These are the gills. They are visible, they are open. Whereas in, this is operculum, where the gills are, closed okay is it clear everyone yes you have three left what next Iram? um the, the, the skin is covered with uh, cycloid and tenoid scales so their skin is covered with scales skin has scales and uh, they didn't have scales. They also have scales, tough skin, but placoid scales. And what scales are here? Cycloid. We also call it tenoid. It's the same word, like same meaning, two different words. Cycloid or tenoid scale are there, placoid are in chondriopthys. And what did it say? Air. They don't have Oh, sorry, they have air bladder. Air bladder is present, which regulates um, buoyancy. Yes, air bladder is present, it's positive, which means air bladder helps the fish to stay afloat in the water. So if those fish who have air bladder can afford to sleep, you know, even the fish which do not have air bladder also show sleep, but they always have to be, um, at least some part of the brain has to be active to see that they are constantly swimming. These fish does not need to constantly swim. They can just go under a rock and rest there, or they can just stop swimming in the water at a level and they will stay afloat. They will not go very deep down. So they will not drown, you know? It sounds weird, but fish also can drown in the water. It sounds like birds can fall on the ground, but which they can, right? Fish can also drown. Is it clear, everyone? Was he a Yusuf? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So three points for osteoptis are done. Yes, Aram. What else? So under this osteoptis. Sorry. Next yes. class. No, we, uh, we are doing osteoptis. Only three points you want? Uh, I feel other all are very common. Yeah. In so you can just remember heart, uh, like uh, their heart have a true auricle and a true ventricle. Two chambered heart is there in fish, all the fish. But in those chambers, 
the auricle like human we have two atriums and two ventricles atriums are also known as auricles you know that similarly fish have just one auricle and one ventricle okay and in osteopathies you can see it very very clearly but yes rests are all very common they are cold blooded their sexes are separate fertilization is always external in case of fish um, in, in in case of bony fish and they are oviparous they lay eggs and the development is direct they don't have larval stages okay so these are the major important and uh, the the rule is that examples you have to do you have to go to ncrt and do the examples because these are fresh water so many fish are must be you must be knowing like uh, katla katla and rohu are the most common fish that are consumed and there are some um, aquarius uh, aquarium fishes like uh, fighting fish that's called betta or angel fish you all must be knowing about angel fish right they, they you will find angel fish in aquarium so angel fish and uh, fighting fish which is betta and terophyllum they are they also come under osteo osteopathies okay now let's go to class 4 what is class 4 i think it is the first class of tetrapoda right you know yes sir so now from fish we go to tetrapoda and what is the class amphibia amphibia now from here onwards things become little easy because you have studied amphibians reptiles birds and mammals these four things you have studied uh, in your junior classes as well if not in detail but at least the basics am i correct yes sir yes so tell me about amphibians um from yeah yes sir um they they can they usually comprise those organism which are cold blooded and require an aquatic habitat to lay eggs yes see all only mammals and birds can regulate their body temperature rest all are cold blooded makes sense to you only mammals and birds can regulate the body temperature they are warm blooded organisms rest amphibians reptiles fish both chondroptiths and osteopathies and cyclostomata they are all cold blooded okay will you remember that so amphibians are for sure cold blooded yes iram and um these organisms um possess protruding eyes which are protected by usually one pair of eyelids <laughs> yes and sometimes yes they have eyelids uh, but how did they get their name it's very interesting amphibians the word amphi means dual yes okay so they are dual and the b n word or bio word comes from life bios amphi bios so they live a dual life why do i say that they live a dual life what what dual life they live they are aquatic as well as terrestrial so they have to depend on both so you will always find amphibians near water watery areas okay you will not find amphibians very much away like for in example in desert you you will find reptiles in deserts but not amphibians or even if you are finding it there they must be near some pond or lake or oasis they are always dependent on water because remember this point their eggs do not have shells okay if you see uh, salamanders or frogs there are amphibians their eggs are jelly like have you seen any frogs egg in in documentary or in anywhere frog egg it's gelatinous tadpole? it's like tadpole comes come out of frog eggs but you know how do the eggs look like they look like jelly you can see the tadpole inside <coughs> from outside so these eggs are called gelatinous eggs they do not have a hard shell covering so they cannot survive in the open where the sunlight is there they will just dry and die so amphibians always lay their eggs near or in the water where there is moisture and when these um um 
larvae of amphibians to come out, like tadpole come out, the first, for the first few, uh, uh, first few, uh, first, sorry, initial part of their life, they spend in the water, then they come out of the water. Now they can go out for food, for mating, for uh, finding a living place or breeding place. But again, when they have to lay eggs, they have to come in the water. So that's where amphibians dual life comes. They have to be dependent on water and land. So they are aquatic and terrestrial both. Okay. Is it clear? So they are born underwater. Yes, mostly. Okay. Make sense, Yusuf? Yes, makes sense. Okay, very good. Yes, Hiram. So you were saying that about amphibians, what should we write? Um, they're cold blooded and require an aquatic habitat to lay egg. Yes, that I have written. Cold blooded require aquatic habitat to lay eggs. Okay. And? Uh, these organisms are mainly characterized by two pairs of limbs, uh, smooth and... Before, before, yes, you're right. Before going to limbs, uh, let me tell you, their body can be divisible into two parts only, head and trunk. Okay. Body divisible into head and trunk. They don't have the concept of a neck per se. Tail may be present in some, for example, salamander have tails, so you call head, trunk and tail, but uh, there can be amphibians like frog who do not have tails. Tadpoles had tails. The tails get diminished, but frogs do not have tails. Is it clear? Tadpole looks more like fish, not like frog. Yes. So body is divisible into head and trunk mainly. Tails, you can write, are possessed by some. Some amphibians. And now you can also say that they have eyelids they have eyelids they can cover their eyes with the eyelids and now we go to what you were saying what you were saying they have two pairs of limbs smooth and amount skin for respiration yes so they have two pair of limbs which means they have four limbs they're tetrapod of course so two pair of limbs and a moist skin. So two pair of limbs is very common because they are tetrapoda. So I'm not writing two pair of limbs. Moist skin for breathing is something which is their characteristic feature because they live in water and land both. When they're living in water, remember amphibians, do they have gills or do they have lungs is the question. Vaziha, you tell. Should answer something. Everyone should answer at least one question in the class. Was they you? have, they have limbs, but um, they have lungs, but they do not have uh, gills because yes, their respira uh, their respiration is by their body. See, their majority of respiration is by the lungs, right? Because it yes, does not sir. make sense if you have lungs and you are not using them, right? Lungs are proper, full fledged organs. So it makes no sense if you have a bicycle and you're walking, uh, like you're walking to school. You should better use your bicycle. But you can also walk to school is one additional thing, right? But it will not be as effective as bicy bicycling or biking to your school. So mostly, um, the, the, these organisms, amphibians, breathe through lungs just like we do. But when they are in water, and if they are submerged or around water. Uh, they can also directly absorb oxygen through their moist skin. So they have a moist skin for breathing. Okay. 
breathing lungs present and i write positive it means lungs are present also some because they are at the borderline amphibians are at the borderline between fish and reptiles so fish totally rely on water makes sense amphibians rely both on land and water they are the connecting link reptiles do not rely on water it's their choice if they want to go back and adapt to water that that they have done later on but reptiles can live without water like can live without being in water not without water we all need water to drink but they can live without water uh, to lay eggs so like snakes snakes and uh, chameleons lizards they are all reptiles uh, like tortoises they are all reptiles who can live without water but turtle is a another reptile who has uh, adapted itself to live in water okay but still turtle lay eggs outside the water you know that because turtle is not an amphibian turtle is a reptile make sense everyone is it yes sir so some have gills as well just remember that but mostly they breathe through lungs and moist skin anything else you want to add <clears throat> iram yes sir um elementary canal urinary and reproductive tract open into a common um, chamber called as cloaca 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 right so they have cloaca okay from here the cloaca will persist in reptiles as well as in birds okay so cloaca is where it's a common chamber a common opening or chamber for elementary which means digestive urinary and reproductive tract okay digestive urinary and reproductive tract is it clear everyone rest that they are cold blooded sexes are separate fertilization is external because they uh, for they lay eggs in the water so females lay eggs and the male release sperm and fertilization happens in the water external they are oviparous but here the development is indirect in contrary uh, sorry in osteochthyes bony fish the development was direct but here the development is indirect always remember that frog frog's baby does not look like frog that's that is what is called a indirect development where there are larval stages through which an organism goes before becoming an adult okay makes sense so so i have a question yes hero so there's a word called um, tympanum tympanum is it a yes tympanum i forgot tympanum let's put here with eyelids tympanum is it's equivalent to ear okay but it's just like so they don't have a ear you you will never see a frog with a hole for example you will also not see a snake have you say, seen a snake with ears they will look very amazing they look funny imagine a snake with ears or a frog with ears so they don't have <laughs> they don't have outer ear at all so our a human ear is very advanced and it has three regions this one the outer part is called pinna it's the outer ear it's just it just has one role to make our listening more refined so it's like an antenna sound waves when which are coming towards our ear gets um, uh, in, uh, collected by the pinna and is sent inside a tube so this when you reach the eardrum from there your middle ear starts okay so eardrum is at the middle ear and then you have a inner ear which has bones very very small three bones in cus malleus and stapes the smallest human bones are the bones of the inner ear this is a neat question which has which, which had come they are called incus malleus and stapes malleus incus and stapes actually in the series it's called miss i remember it by miss malleus incus stapes 
okay if in case if you misheard i am again telling you malleus incus and stapes okay these are smallest bones but in case of amphibians they just have a membrane <clears throat> a membrane which can vibrate which can sense vibrations act as a ear that's called tympanum okay is it clear so if you look at a snake or a frog head carefully you will see that where the ear should have been there it's just a membrane present and you can distinguish that membrane different from from other uh, other regions of that skull that's called a tympanum so tympanum represents ear that's all so five things are done everything is done you know you want to add something it's done done an example is toads frogs tree frogs salamander and there is something called uh, ichthyophis ichthyophis is limbless amphibia amphibians have limbs they are tetrapoda but some amphibians are limbless it does not mean that they they could not have limbs their ancestors like they evolved from limbed organisms you know snakes also used to have limbs before how do we know that and also another thing in the class whatever i say or whatever is written in ncert you should not believe it as the word set in stone question argument ask for proofs on what basis i am saying something or on what basis ncert says something because let me tell you ncert at many point at multiple points is not very accurate but this is the book you have to refer for your boards and exams so that's why you study it you need some confined syllabus right even if the syllabus at times is outdated so but you keep constantly ask asking you should keep asking questions so if i say that snakes earlier had legs just a story right what is the proof of it and if scientists are saying it they will not just be making a story what evidence will convince you that snakes had uh, limbs or their ancestors had limbs if not snakes any one of you have seen a skeleton of a snake image yes 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 who has seen vazia yes so if you carefully look at the snakes like bigger snakes you will see that at four distinct points where legs should have been there you will see there are small bones still attached they are very very small so they don't develop and but you will see something like this so this is the head let's say and a snake skeleton will just be like series of bones like this there will be bones lot of bones lot of bones correct yes these are all like this but at one point of time you have you will see some rudimentary bones like this still present here which got they lost their limbs because they adapted to live in burrows they adapted to wriggle okay instead of walking so that's there so that's but that's reptile so amphibians also there are some limbless amphibians possible okay now let's quickly come to reptilia you know so this is the class 5 reptilia yes sir uh this class name refers to the to their creeping and crawling mode of locomotion mm -hmm. so they creep and they crawl mostly yes and uh they are mostly terrestrial animals and have dry conified skin with scales and or scute yes so they do not have a moist skin like amphibians because they do not depend on water they do not live in water they can adapt themselves to live in water like crocodiles and turtles but still they will not have moist skin their skins will be uh, dry and with cornified scales which are called epidermal scales yes perfect so i'm not writing everything just you just know it everyone has opened ncert along with 
Was he here, Yusuf Devangi? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, so you understood. Next, you know. Uh, yes, they do not have an external ear, ear opening. Yes, they also have tympanum, just like amphibians. Okay, and? Uh, heart is usually three chambered, but four chambered in crocodiles. Yes, so for amphibians, what was the heart? Amphibians. Amphibians have three chambered heart. Before that, Osteochthyes have a two chambered heart, one auricle and one ventricle. When amphibians evolved, they evolved an extra auricle. So they have two auricles and one ventricle. Reptiles also had a three, have a three chambered heart mostly. The only exception is crocodile. Crocodile is a reptile, but it's known as a living fossil because it behaves very different from other reptiles. It looks very different. It looks as if it has it has been frozen in time. If you look at a crocodile carefully, it gives you some dinosaur vibes, isn't it? Very powerful yes, jaws, sir. scaly skin, powerful scaly tail, and a four-chambered heart. Okay, so a crocodile is an exception, being a reptile having four-chambered heart. Otherwise, reptiles also have a three-chambered heart, two auricles and one ventricle. Okay, yes. Next, you know. Um, yeah, and last, reptiles are poikilotherms, cold-blooded. Poikilotherms, yes, they are cold-blooded. And reptiles also do one thing that is unique. They shed their skin because these epidermal scales inside which they live when they grow, these skins become short, smaller. It's like our clothes. So because they are dead tissues covering them, they cannot grow. The dead tissues can't grow. So many reptiles like snakes and lizards, they have to shed their scales at multiple times in their life as they are growing out of them. Okay? So shedding of scales is something seen in reptiles and it's unique. Similar kind of thing you see in insects also, insects and also spiders. Spiders shed their skin and, and when they grow and come out. So after insects, you see that thing in reptiles. Is it clear everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Sexes are separate as they say, correct? Fertilization is internal now here. They are not dependent on water. In amphibians, fertilization was mostly external. In reptiles, it is internal. And they lay eggs, and their eggs have shell around it. So eggs of birds and reptiles have a hard shell around it. Other eggs of amphibians and fish are soft shells. OK? Only reptiles and birds have hard shells. So that they can lay shell uh, eggs anywhere on the land and it will not de desiccate in the sun. It will still survive. Okay, so they are oviparous and their development is direct. No larval stage is there. And for reptiles, you know all the examples, turtle, tortoise, chameleon, garden lizard, crocodile, alligator, wall lizard, snake, etc., etc. So that's reptilia. Let's go to quickly go to class six, aves. And since you have uh, NCRT, so uh, is it okay if I give uh, class six to Waziha and seven to Yusuf to summarize and give me five important points? Sure, sir. Yes, Waziha, let's start with class six. If you want, I'll give you two minutes to read. Aves. Aves basically means birds. The word ave comes from avian. Okay. They have so, feathers and mostly are uh, mostly can fly except flightless bird that is ostrich. Okay, let's do one thing. Take two minutes, read this paragraph, and in this two minute, uh, Yusuf, you also read the mammalia paragraph, the mammals, the final paragraph. 
and then i want five points not more than that you can you can give me less i am happy but five characteristic points for birds and mammal okay as you say sir ji hain yusuf cool so i'm giving you two minutes i'll quickly get some water for me i'll be back okay iram okay wazia shall we move yes sir yes class 6 aves tell me what five features would you think are the most important for birds ear cavity they uh, they have endoskeleton is full fully ossified bony and the long bones are hollow with air cavity which is help them to uh, fly in air, air perfect so for birds the first and the most important thing that you should remember which is not happening in any other organism is that they can fly so birds have flight now to fly if and birds have evolved from reptiles that we know they, that we have proofs for but reptiles are heavy reptiles have proper bones like amphibians and humans like mammals but birds have a hollow bones they are called pneumatic bones okay the bones are lighter that's why they can fly with ease so first is ossified hollow bones correct second uh skin is dry without glands except the oil gland at the base of the tail yes so they have only oil glands but uh, on the skin you should also remember more than more important than that is feathers birds have feathers no other class have feathers mm -hmm. or no other organisms have feathers no reptiles no amphibians no mammals have feathers mammals have hair on their body birds have feathers on their body reptiles have scales on their body amphibians have moist skin and fish have again scales Osteopathies have 
retinoid scales and chondroitis have placoid scales just remember these things okay they cool feathers beak. they possess beak yes so they have feathers they have pneumatic bones hollow bones and beak okay cool and their forelimbs are modified into wings and their hind limbs are uh, generally have scales uh, which is modified for walking swimming or uh, climbing in the tree clasping right. in the tree on the tree right so they, they but, but they are also tetrapods they have four uh, appendages chamber heart no no they have four appendages okay and the first two appendages which are four up four legs have modified into wings bat also has the similar thing done you know but for bat all the four appendages are modified for uh, flying and but they, they do not have feathers only birds have feathers and their hind limbs are still like legs they use it for walking yes and the last is you have you have exhausted four what will be their last they have their respiration is by lungs that and oh, even reptiles thermos yes so you should say that they have a complete four chambered heart because this is something unique to birds reptiles and amphibians don't have it only birds and mammals have so birds have a complete four chambered heart and they are warm blooded right Yes. what do we mean by warm blooded it does not means that all the time our blood is warm and boiling it means that we can maintain our body temperature through blood whenever the body needs to yes. warm up we can warm our blood up and it will go to every part of the body and warm the body makes sense which is very useful for winter to survive yeah <laughs> yes yes correct that's why um, you will find mammals and birds even in the coldest of the regions but you will not find reptiles there in arctic and antarctic much more many reptiles won't be there because reptiles cannot they hate winters you will see that uh, on a winter day if you go to a zoo or something and you see reptiles do you see lizards around in winters no snakes yeah. lizards they all hibernate in the winters even amphibians they are cold blooded so they hibernate in the winters they don't like to come out because they cannot maintain their body temperature they will die so they go into the burrow and sleep for 4 to 6 months remember if we were cold blooded and we had to sleep for 4 to 6 months i am sure that someone will still like this uh, deal but it will be like losing yeah half of the life just sleeping because we were yes. cold blooded so we can maintain our body temperature and birds can also do that yeah. yeah okay respiration is by lungs because it's obvious and their sexes are separate they have fertilization which is internal and they lay eggs but the development is direct and birds i don't need to tell you examples you know examples of birds all the birds okay yusuf your first kind of presentation mammals right. what what so, five important things you class 7 mammalia so yep. there are thousands of different species of mammals uh, i'm not going to name all but there are few mentioned here macropus petropus balena um balen you you can just simply say duck billed platypus kangaroo mm -hmm. whale and bat kangaroo yeah oh yeah. all right so, so they are they are mostly found kangaroo. in they are mostly found in places such as polar ice caps deserts mountains forests grasslands and dark caves yes so you don't have to use the word mostly here because you covered every, almost everything on the planet so we, you can say that mammals are found everywhere right. and one thing that allows them to live everywhere is that they can regulate their body temperature mammals can also live in very hot environments because they can keep their blood cool so are can we also mammals live in... yeah of course we are mammals humans are mammals the word mammal comes from mammary glands 
so mammals have something that no other class has mammary glands so the females feed their babies through their breasts the breast milk okay so this way you can just remember which all are mammals right so we are mammals okay it comes from mammary glands and mammals live in all the uh, environments even in water so if you say in water aquatic mammal is whale whale is the mammal it's aquatic it's not a fish flying mammal is bat uh, australian mammal is kangaroo and the first one the example which you are talking about is called ornitho rhynchus okay the ornitho rhynchus is the only mammal which lays eggs mammals do not lay eggs mammal give birth to yes. their young ones mm -hmm. but ornitho rhynchus is called duck billed platypus its common name is duck billed platypus and it's the only mammal that lay eggs okay so just remember that right yeah so first thing you said that they are found in all habitats second yes, i added that they have mammary glands mm -hmm. that's why they and they feed their young ones with milk they feed their young ones with milk because they have no um, so it comes third point they move yes. on four limbs they have two pairs of limbs adapted for walking running climbing burrowing swimming or flying yes so that they, they are tetrapods and they can walk on four limbs two or four depending most of the mammals walk on four limbs the mammals which walk on two limbs are called bipedals or primates humans are bipedal by Bi means two pedal means you know pedal foot so we are bipedal organisms okay the another the, we don't have um, uh, the closest bipedal organism to human is chimpanzee which is not always bipedal but it has the capability to be bipedal because it's a primate rest other mammals like uh, lion tiger cattle cows buffaloes goats they all walk on four limbs okay next what else um, they can be furry and hairy yes so they have hair as i told you and they have external ear no other um, organism apart from ma uh, mammals have external ear birds don't have external ear reptiles clearly amphibians fish they don't have external ears only mammals have okay yeah and the external ear is called pinna okay pinna so yeah. this is the fifth important criteria now rest you know heart is four chambered truly four chambered like after birds they are uh, homeothermous they can maintain their body temperature they, they also have by brain. brain brain to all organs no, like big brain, brain. <laughs> big brain okay compared to yes we have big brains because we are mammals yes even okay. in mammals primates have the biggest brain even in primates humans have the biggest brain okay uh, what is the biggest mammal biggest mammal in land or in water in water it's blue whale blue on whale. land it's african elephant all right okay if you're talking about largest it's african elephant if you're talking about longest it's the giraffe on land in water it's blue whale okay all right yeah. and at the end of the chapter can you all see a table 4.2 which is a salient features of different phyla in the animal kingdom can you see that yes sir if possible get that table printed and put it somewhere in your study where you can see it often because this summarizes everything and you will keep a track of all from polyphyla to chordata you will have a track of all the phylum their level of organization symmetry coelom segmentation digestive system circulatory respiratory and some distinct features so with this this chapter ends i give you i'll stop here for let's say two more minutes and i'll give you some time to reflect back on the chapter and ask me if you have any doubt any one of you iram devangi wazia and yusuf any doubts just take 2 minutes go through the notes and waziha and yusuf go through the ncert and let me know and then if you have no doubts i'll start with the photosynthesis in higher plants i'll just give you a 
a fundamental introduction today and on wednesday we'll start with the full fledged chapter and we don't have class later... tomorrow uh, yes uh, one at a time yes let's first go to yusuf yusuf what do you say um, do we not have class tomorrow so we have on mondays and wednesday the same time okay it's a monday wednesday batch okay so two classes for biology per week two classes for chemistry and two classes for physics six days in a week one day you get pre you should get to off one day right so monday right. and wednesday same time now was here what were you saying was here sir can you uh, explain all the chapter which uh, your batch students has completed later can uh, you explain all the chapters which so, have done uh, in your batch which have been done so what we what i can do is we, we go through this so when someone joins in the middle so all these lectures are recorded okay and the recordings okay. are with lanivio and uh, you both of you uh, will be at so you must be getting messages or communication from a number right lanivio's number yes sir. yes sir. so tell them to add you in the whatsapp group that group i am also there and in that group you can just say which the chapters that have been done you will get the uh, video links recorded links of the classes so you go through those links make the notes and if you have any doubts so we will have doubt classes towards the end okay. but it will be because it will be uh, difficult because i spent time when i explain things it will be difficult to redo the syllabus again it will be like in one year academic year you cannot do the syllabus twice if you are going at a explanatory pace that can be done in a you know um these crash course kind of a pace but we spend time right so you can go through you will get all the video links you can go through all of them and you can come up come to me with any doubt from any chapter and that we will solve if you have okay. more doubt then we will keep a additional extra class for that so okay. that we can do okay all right sir Yes, Devangi has a question, sir. What is the reproduction and fertilization in echinoderms? Yes, echinoderms. I think uh, Iram only did. Iram, what is the reproduction in echinoderms? Remember echinoderms. Echinoderms have a radial symmetry as an adult, but as a larva, it has a bilateral symmetry. So there's something special about echinoderm. but she is asking about the <coughs> fertilization so fertilization yeah tell me you know fertilization is but, external with yes so because remember they are aquatic organisms you know in aquatic organisms uh, you will see that it's more convenient for females to lay eggs and simultaneously males lay sperms and then the they fertilize each uh, the sperm fertilize the ovum in the water itself so fertilization is mostly external in uh, echinoderms is that clear devangi and what about reproduction i think by reproduction she means the development after fertilization right because reproduction is sexual there are two type of reproduction is sexual and asexual so sexes are there in echinoderms which means it they do sexual reproduction and their sexes are separate as well so reproduction is sexual and fertilization is external and development is indirect because i told you echinoderms have radial symmetry as adults and bilateral symmetry as larvae okay, okay so uh devang is it clear to you does that answer your question yes sir okay very good and remember the, with the echinoderms the most important feature is water vascular system a similar kind of system i taught you in porifera which is known as water canal system water canal system and water vascular system are two different things okay just because you asked about it so it came to my head okay so just reflect back if you have any more doubts good so yes iram i have a question uh, yes. cool blooded animals are the animals that do not they are not capable of regulating their body temperature right 
Yes, right. Right. Was that the question? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Why? Okay. You are asking why we can do it and they cannot do it. Yes. Okay. Very good question. So when I say cold blooded, you know we get fever. Humans get fever, right? Yes, sir. Only warm blooded organisms can get fever, but because what is fever? So there is a benefit of us being warm blooded, is that we can feel good on a chilly winter day, like Vaziha said. There is benefit of being uh, uh, warm blooded because we can also regulate our body temperature by regulating the blood's temperature. But we also have a disadvantage. But you tell me, is it a disadvantage to have fever? You know what is fever? No. Why do we have fever? No, it's not a disadvantage according to Iram. So what is it, Iram? What is it? Yes, Devangi has raised hand. Yes, Devangi. What is fever? Sir, I think it helps us to uh, fight the infection and it happens because of our immune system. Perfect. It is our immune response, first, first pass response. Whenever there's a pathogen attacking, it goes into the system, blood senses it, and the blood temperature goes up so that the pathogen either gets killed or gets inactivated or gets slow. So that our immune system gets the time to fight it effectively. So our fever is a response to any kind of inflammation or systemic infection in the body. So that's why we can better fight, resist diseases as well. Now, cold-blooded organisms cannot get fever. Now, Iram's question was, why can't, why, how can we regulate? I think it was a mechanistic question. So it is very elaborate molecularly um, and it's still under research. We understand many aspects of it. One is uh, we have some molecules which are called pyretics or pyrogens in the body. In the brain, we have a higher brain center that just works to keep the blood temperature uh, fixed, okay? That blood temperature, what is our uh, body temperature for warm blooded organisms in humans? What is our average body temperature? Or the standard body temperature? In degrees Celsius degrees. Celsius, 97 degrees Celsius, 96 or 97. It's 98.6. 98. 98.6. Yes. 98. Hey, Devangi, you were saying the same thing? Sorry, I think I answered before you. Before you. Sir, Devangi. Uh, I think it is 32 Celsius. 98.4 is the Fahrenheit. Yes, 98.6, 98.4 to 98.6, they call it. And these are all standards made by Western countries. So it can be slightly more or less. There's always a range in, see, remember in biology, nothing is, nothing is fixed. They always say that our heartbeat is 72 beats per minute, right? No one's heart beats 72 beats per minute throughout the day. When you sleep, it goes beyond, below in the 60s or 50s. When you're running, it's in 80, 90, 100, even to 120, okay? So, and under different conditions, under different temperature, climates, heartbeats can differ. Same is with body temperature, but it stays in, in degree Celsius, it is 37 degree Celsius, okay? And uh, 36.9 to 37.2 degree Celsius. And in uh, degree Fahrenheit, it's 98.6 degree Fahrenheit, 98.4 to 98.6 degree Fahrenheit. That is maintained by, so blood constantly keeps going in the brain and in the brain, there's a higher brain center that keeps checking. It's like, a, it's like our own biological thermometer. It keeps checking. And if we are feeling cold and our blood temperature is going down, it will start breaking um, energy bonds. And you know, ATP, we have energy molecules in our body, in our cells. These energy molecules have bonds that contain heat energy. If you break these bonds, heat will be released. That's how we feel warm after eating food. 
you understand everyone was here yes of devangi yes sir yep iram yes so is it clear iram how do how can we because we have mechanism of introducing the uh, controlling the temperature of the blood okay by putting heat energy in it and they are called pyrogens that increase blood uh, temperature you remember when we have fever what do doctors give us any medicine you know that we take during fever panadol paracetamol paracetamol crocin yes. crocin crocin is paracetamol crocin is a is a is a brand name dolo crocin you know pandol these are all basically they are paracetamol so paracetamol as a drug chemical drug it's called anti pyretic drug <clears throat> anti means against antibiotic same concept anti means against okay pyretic means temperature temperature or heat okay so it's against heat these drugs lower down our body temperature by you know how do they act to cool down the blood what do they do what happens if you have fever and you take paracetamol after 2 3 hours what happens 1 or 2 hours you sweat profusely right if you sweat which means your fever is broken that's what they say right yes can you make sense what i'm saying fever is there you take paracetamol and then you sweat so body becomes cool blood becomes cool so this is how antipyretic drugs work they go and tell the brain to not increase the blood's temperature instead to cool down the blood through sweating similarly if you have uh, medicine against pain it is called analgesic okay so just some biochemistry for you okay anyways so what we'll do is because uh, uh, do you have any other questions i'll just take questions for this chapter today and i'll start photosynthesis afresh on wednesday then you can ask any other doubts or questions that have that you have in your mind uh, in your mind devangi yusuf waziha iram any more questions no sir not yet not yet okay so you can also do one thing if you have any question throughout the day or like today tomorrow you know that on wednesday is your class you can note it and when i start the class i always ask if you have any doubts to begin with so we always start the class and end the class with questions and doubts okay so you can come up with your doubts in the next class yusuf and wazia uh, i'll see you in the next class then devangi aniram all four of you yes sir yes sir